Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 12 of the Garot Podcast. I am your host, Chingachgook, and I am once again in studio with my co-host, Mr. Howard Rourke. Today's episode, similar to previous episodes, is going to be very difficult for me. In previous episodes, I have described the psychological sensation of metaphorically being strapped inside the garage. Today is nothing less. The condition arises from a kind of mismatch of sorts. On the one hand, in keeping with the entire theme of this podcast of bringing terms into articulated knowledge, rendering the definitions of terms into freestanding claims, we're only having to do one today. And the term that we will be discussing today is the Holden Mode problem. Now, Holden Mode, Holden Mode problem, they exist squarely within the realm of unarticulated knowledge for me. I understand it. I know how to use it. I'm familiar with it. But I am placed in the situation where I need to carry a degree of weight regarding this term that I'm not necessarily equipped to handle. I have tried multiple times to explain this term to third parties, and I've failed miserably in the past. My role in this project, my role in having this conversation is I'm the one who has to be the navigator. I am the one who has to ensure that I ask the questions. Because unless I can formulate a question that exists squarely within Aristotle's grid, how could you speak? Well, I can't read your mind, and that becomes a form of initiation, which I'm willing to respond to. Let's start way far back and see if we can chart a course that will bring us closer to the crux of this term hopefully in a way that the audience sitting at home will be able to follow. Because I don't think I have the ability to discuss the term hold the mode problem starting from a thumb up position. My only strategy that I have available to me at this point is to start from thumb down and then eventually work the thumb up. One of the first and immediate problems that I have routinely encountered when trying to use this term with others is the individuals in question have not read the text from which the term arises. Now, specifically, Holden is the given name of Holden Caulfield, who is the main character in J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye. The Catcher in the Rye was a novel that I read upon your recommendation. So arguably, your familiarity with this novel exceeds my own, because you've known about it for longer. You've probably read it more times than I have. You have had more space to wrestle with this text than me by mere virtue of the fact that you encountered the text much younger than I did. So right off the bat, it is not immediately clear to me how to sufficiently describe Holden Caulfield's character to those who have never read the book. And usually when I have in the past attempted to speak about this term, I didn't have the text on hand. And my attempts to describe Holden Caulfield were feeble. And then on top of that, describing Holden Caulfield in and of itself is insufficient because what is of note is not Holden Caulfield's character himself, but rather the idea that he represents in the story. So how do you do that to the generic person who has not read Salinger's work, who has not read The Catcher in the Rye. And the entire reason why I find myself in these positions is because the thumb-up freestanding definition as it exists in Aristotle's grid is simply not on hand. But then again, that's why we're here right now. So what I'm going to try to do is I am going to attempt to harvest 
what I think might be the representative passages from The Catcher in the Rye to enable the generic listener to understand to the level of function Holden Caulfield's character. And then that hopefully will provide the platform for us to start pushing into more thumb up material. I would add on as well that The Catcher in the Rye has a tremendous amount of material to be harvested and Holden Caulfield's character stands as an example of a character that encapsulates a very specific problem very well. And it's a problem that I started paying attention to after I read this book, and the term has since become a reference to this problem when I encounter it. So there are a lot of reasons for why Holden is the character that I have used historically to reference this problem, as all great texts that I can think of for myself create references of different kinds. But an analysis of this problem doesn't get you comprehensive depth of the text of Salinger. This character can very poignantly point to a specific problem as it exists that I've been able to observe. So the first passage that I'm going to read is in chapter 2. It's about 11 to 12 paragraphs in. In my edition, it's page 12. That's not that long. It's just a couple paragraphs. It reads... Old Spencer started nodding again. He also started picking his nose. He made out like he was only pinching it, but he was really getting the old thumb right in there. I guess he thought it was all right to do because it was only me that was in the room. I didn't care, except that it's pretty disgusting to watch somebody pick their nose. Then, he said, I had the privilege of meeting your mother and dad when they had their little chat with Dr. Thurmer some weeks ago. They're grand people. Yes, they are. They're very nice. Grand. There's a word I really hate. It's phony. I could puke every time I hear it. I read this passage because this word phony is a trope in the entirety of the novel. Holden Caulfield throughout the entire story, essentially haphazardly goes from event to event to event without any kind of what Dr. Peterson would call conscientiousness. Perhaps. And everything that he encounters, he describes or belittles with this adjective phony. The adjective phony is, in my reading of the novel, inseparable from his character, particularly with regards to his speech. Everything he encounters falls under the category of phony, functionally. A lot of things do, and it is a common ad hominem tactic that he deploys, definitely. I would not say everything, though, but if he wants it to be, it is. So I'm going to skip now to chapter 22, to the one thing that possibly can be excluded from the category of phony, but it's the part after leaving his boarding school, wandering around the city, he sneaks back home. And this is after the novel has already established that he's been kicked out of boarding school after boarding school after boarding school to talk with his little sister. And so this scene here, starting in chapter 22, is the exchange that he has with his sister, which I think is extremely telling, particularly with regards to this trope of everything being phony. So beginning of chapter 22, it reads, When I came back, she had the pillow off her head, all right. I knew she would. But she still wouldn't look at me, even though she was laying on her back and all. When I came around the side of the bed and sat down again, she turned her crazy face the other way. She was ostracizing the hell out of me, just like the fencing team at Pensy when I left all the goddamn foils on the subway. How is old Hazel Weatherfield? I said. You write any new stories about her? I got that one you sent me right in my suitcase. It's down at the station. It's very good. Daddy'll kill you. Boy, she really gets something on her mind when she gets something on her mind. No, he won't. 
The worst he'll do, he'll give me hell again, and then he'll send me to that goddamn military school. That's all he'll do to me. And in the first place, I won't even be around. I'll be away. I'll be... I'll probably be in Colorado on this ranch. Don't make me laugh. You can't even ride a horse. Who can't? Sure I can. Certainly I can. They can teach you in about two minutes, I said. Stop picking at that. She was picking at the adhesive tape on her arm. Who gave you that haircut? I asked her. I just noticed what a stupid haircut somebody gave her. It was way too short. None of your business, she said. She can be very snotty sometimes. She can be quite snotty. I suppose you failed in every single subject again, she said. Very snotty. It was sort of funny too, in a way. She sounds like a goddamn school teacher sometimes, and she is only a little child. No, I didn't, I said. I passed English. Then, just for the hell of it, I gave her a pinch on the behind. It was sticking way out in the breeze, the way she was lying on her side. She has hardly any behind. I didn't do it hard, but she tried to hit my hand away anyways, but she missed. All of a sudden, she said, Oh, why did you do it? She meant, why did I get the axe again? It made me sort of sad, the way she said it. Oh, God, Phoebe, don't ask me. I'm sick of everybody asking me that, I said. A million reasons why. It was one of the worst schools I ever went to. It was full of phonies and mean guys. You never saw so many mean guys in your life. For instance, if you were having a bull session in somebody's room and somebody wanted to come in, nobody let them in if they were some dopey, pimply guy. Everybody was always locking their door when somebody wanted to come in. And they had this goddamn secret fraternity that I was too yellow not to join. There was this one pimply, boring guy, Robert Ackley, that wanted to get in. He kept trying to join, and they wouldn't let him, just because he was boring and pimply. I don't even feel like talking about it. It was a stinking school, take my word. Old Phoebe didn't say anything, but she was listening. I could tell by the back of her neck that she was listening. She always listens when you tell her something. And the funny part is she knows, half the time, what the hell you're talking about. She really does. I kept talking about old Pensy. I sort of felt like it. Even the couple of nice teachers on the faculty. They were phonies too, I said. There was this one old guy, Mr. Spencer. His wife was always giving you hot chocolate and all that stuff. And they were really pretty nice. But you should have seen them when the headmaster, old Thurmer, came in the history class and sat down in the back of the room. He was always coming in and sitting down in the back of the room for about half an hour. He was supposed to be incognito or something. After a while, he'd be sitting back there, and then he'd start interrupting what old Spencer was saying to crack a lot of corny jokes. Old Spencer would practically kill himself chuckling and smiling and all, like as if Thurmer were a goddamn prince or something. Don't swear so much. It would have made you puke. I swear it would, I said. Then, on Veterans Day, they have this day, Veterans Day, that all the jerks that graduated from Pensy around 1776 come back and walk all over the place, with their wives and children and everybody. You should have seen this one old guy that was about 50. What he did was, he came in our room and knocked on the door and asked us if we'd mind if he used the bathroom. The bathroom was at the end of the corridor. I don't know why the hell he asked us. You know what he said? He said he wanted to see if his initials were still on one of the can doors. What he did, he carved his goddamn stupid saddled initials in one of the can doors about 90 years ago, and he wanted to see if they were still there. So my roommate and I walked him down to the bathroom and all, and we had to stand there while he looked for his initials in all the can doors. He kept talking to us the whole time, telling us how when he was at Pensy, they were the happiest days of his life, and giving us a lot of advice for the future and all. Boy, did he depress me. I don't mean he was a bad guy. He wasn't. But you don't have to be a bad guy to depress somebody. You can be a good guy and do it. All you have to do to depress somebody is give them a lot of phony advice while you're looking for your initials in some candor. That's all you have to do. I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't have been so bad if he hadn't been all out of breath. He was all out of breath from just climbing up the stairs. And the whole time he was looking for his initials, he kept breathing hard, with his nostrils all funny and sad, while he kept telling Stratler and I to get all we could out of Pensy. God, Phoebe. I can't explain. I just didn't like anything that was happening at Pensy. I can't explain. Old Phoebe said something then, but I couldn't hear her. She had the side of her mouth right smack in the pillow, and I couldn't hear her. What? 
I said. Take your mouth away. I can't hear you with your mouth that way. You don't like anything that's happening. It made me even more depressed when she said that. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Sure, I do. Don't say that. Why the hell do you say that? Because you don't. You don't like any schools. You don't like a million things. You don't. When I read through the novel, that was probably the most interesting passage that I read. Because it was the first time that Holden Caulfield received a rebuke, and it actually landed in any sort of noteworthy sense. And even all the way in chapter 22, the word phony keeps coming up. So to the generic third party who has not read The Catcher in the Rye themselves, the most salient characteristic about Holden Caulfield is a kind of nihilism that's basically all-encompassing. Before I get to another passage that I want to share, the best way I can articulate Holden Caulfield's character is to say, Holden Caulfield is a character who is rapidly on his way to nihilism, if he's not already there. Everything is problematic. And so what that turns into is that the natural result from everything being problematic is that nothing matters, which is the definition of nihilism. There's another passage in here in the middle of chapter 12, the bottom of page 93 in my edition. Even though it was so late, old Ernie's was jam-packed, mostly with prep school jerks and college jerks. Almost every damn school in the world gets out earlier for Christmas vacation than the schools I go to. You could hardly check your coat, it was so crowded. It was pretty quiet, though, because Ernie was playing the piano. It was supposed to be something holy, for God's sake, when he sat down at the piano. Nobody's that good. About three couples beside me were waiting for tables, and they were all shoving and standing on tiptoes to get a look at old Ernie while he played. He had a big damn mirror in front of the piano, with this big spotlight on him, so that everybody could watch his face while he played. You couldn't see his fingers while he played, just his big old face. Big deal. I'm not too sure what the name of the song was that he was playing when I came in, but whatever it was, he was really stinking it up. He was putting all these dumb show-offy ripples in the high notes, and a lot of other very tricky stuff that gives me a pain in the ass. You should have heard the crowd, though, when he was finished. You would have puked. They went mad. They were exactly the same morons that laugh like hyenas in the movies at stuff that isn't funny, I swear to God. If I were a piano player or an actor or something and all those dopes thought I was terrific, I'd hate it. I wouldn't even want them to clap for me. People always clap for the wrong things. If I were a piano player, I'd play it in the goddamn closet. One more passage. This is the end of chapter 17, the final three paragraphs of 17. The whole thing was sort of funny in a way, if you thought about it, and all of a sudden I did something I shouldn't have. I laughed. And I have one of these very loud, stupid laughs. I mean, if I ever sat behind myself in a movie or something, I'd probably know where and tell myself to please shut up. It made old Sally madder than ever. I stuck around for a while apologizing and trying to get her to excuse me, but she wouldn't. She kept telling me to go away and leave her alone, so I finally did it. I went inside and got my shoes and stuff, and left without her. I shouldn't have, but I was pretty goddamn fed up by that time. If you want to know the truth, I don't even know why I started all that stuff with her. I mean about going away somewhere to Massachusetts and Vermont and all. I probably wouldn't have taken her even if she'd wanted to go with me. She wouldn't have been anybody to go with. The terrible part, though, is that I meant it when I asked her. That's the terrible part. I swear to God I'm a madman. That part, when I first read it, really jumped out at me. And the annotation that I have in my book here is Notes from the Underground. The punishing, all-consuming darkness of Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground when I read Character in the Rye, I basically see Holden Caulfield as an adolescent version of the Underground Man. And for the sake of those who have not read Notes from the Underground either, Dr. Peterson, I think, has a very good explanation 
particularly in the context of pulling quotes from Notes from the Underground, that I'm going to try to piggyback off of Dr. Peterson's commentary on Dostoevsky, and then I'm going to try to relate it to what it is that I see in Holden Caulfield. So I'm now going to read a small section of Dr. Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. This is Rule 3, Make Friends with People Who Want the Best for You. Specifically, this is the final paragraph of page 76 in my edition. The passage reads, Something like this is detailed in the incomparable Russian author Fyodor Dostoevsky's bitter classic Notes from the Underground, which begins with these famous lines, I am a sick man. I am a spiteful man. I am an unattractive man. I believe my liver is diseased. I want to pause right here, and I'm going to say that part in Catcher, where Holden concludes chapter 17 with the line that says, I swear to God, I'm a madman. My belief is that these are two different authors, two different characters pointing at the same thing. Dr. Peterson's text continues. It is a confession of a miserable, arrogant sojourner in the underworld, of chaos and despair. He analyzes himself mercilessly, but only pays in this manner for a hundred sins, despite committing a thousand. Then, imagining himself redeemed, the underground man commits the worst transgression of the lot. He offers aid to a genuinely unfortunate person, Liza, a woman on the desperate 19th century road to prostitution. He invites her for a visit, promising her to set life back in the proper course. While waiting for her to appear, his fantasies spin increasingly messianic. And then he quotes Dostoevsky. One day passed, however. Another and another. She did not come, and I begin to grow calmer. I felt particularly bold and cheerful after nine o'clock. I even sometimes began dreaming, and rather sweetly. I, for instance, became the salvation of Liza. Simply through her coming to me and my talking to her. I develop her. Educate her. Finally, I notice that she loves me. Loves me passionately. I pretend not to understand. I don't know, however, why I pretend. Just for effect, perhaps. At last, all confusion, transfigured, trembling and sobbing, she flings herself at my feet and says that I am her savior, and that she loves me better than anything in the world. Dr. Peterson comments, Nothing but narcissism of the underground man is nourished by such fantasies. Liza herself is demolished by them. The salvation he offers her demands far more in the way of commitment and maturity than the underground man is willing or able to offer. He simply does not have the character to see it through, something he quickly realizes, and equally quickly rationalizes. Liza eventually arrives at his shabby apartment, hoping desperately for a way out, staking everything she has on the visit. She tells the underground man that she wants to leave her current life. His response? And we return again to a quotation from Dostoevsky. Why have you come to me? Tell me that, please. I begin, gasping for breath and regardless of logical connection in my words. I long to have it out all at once, at one burst. I did not even trouble how to begin. Why have you come? Answer, answer, I cried, hardly knowing what I was doing. I'll tell you, my good girl, why you have come. You've come because I talked sentimental stuff to you then. So now you are as soft as butter and longing for fine sentiments again. So you may as well know that I was laughing at you then, and I am laughing at you now. Why are you shuddering? Yes, I was laughing at you. I had been insulted just before, at dinner, by the fellows who had come that evening before me. I came to you, meaning to thrash one of them. An officer, but I didn't succeed. I didn't find them. I had to avenge the insult on someone to get back my own again. You turned up. I vented my spleen on you and laughed at you. I had been humiliated, so I wanted to humiliate. I had been treated like a rag, so I wanted to show my power. That's what it was. And you imagined I had come there on purpose to save you. Yes? You imagined that? You imagined that? I knew that she would perhaps be muddled and not take it all in exactly, but I knew too that she would grasp the gist of it very well indeed. And so indeed she did. She turned white as a handkerchief, tried to say something, and her lips worked painfully, but she sank on a chair as though she had been felled by an axe, 
and all the time afterwards she listened to me with her lips parted and her eyes wide open, shuddering with awful terror. The cynicism, the cynicism of my words overwhelmed her. Dr. Peterson comments, The inflated self-importance, carelessness, and sheer malevolence of the underground man dashes Liza's last hopes. He understands this well. Worse, something in him was aiming at this all along. And he knows that too. But a villain who despairs of his villainy has not become a hero. A hero is something positive, not just the absence of evil. The way I understand The Catcher in the Rye and Notes from the Underground is from the thumb up perspective, Catcher in the Rye ends where Notes from the Underground begins. Holden Caulfield is on his way to becoming the embodiment of malevolence. I would say that Holden Caulfield is what the underground man looked like in his childhood. If everything is phony, nothing matters. If nothing matters, there is only darkness. And you will try to destroy the world because it is all meaningless. So that is to say, the Holden mode problem has very high stakes. The Holden mode problem is more than just dissatisfaction. It's more than just baseless criticism. It is the road to hell. It can be, and I think that it's appropriate at this juncture to point out that Holden's fate is not nihilism. There are parts of the text that absolutely support his tendency towards nihilism and resentment. But as you just pointed out, he's on the path there. And there are other parts of the text that I suppose the optimistic reader would look at and hope that there's a different path that he ends up taking. I have to vehemently disagree. In my reading of The Catcher in the Rye, I think Holden is doomed. Well, if we're looking at one of the major questions of the text, one of the few major questions of the text is, did the character Holden Caulfield learn anything? I think the answer is a resounding no, which is why I say Catcher in the Rye ends where Nose from the Underground begins. I don't think there is a credible argument that can be made to say that Holden Caulfield has the capacity for redemption. Well, of course there is. There has to be. That's the utility of identifying the Holden mode problem, is that there is a solution to it. But he rejects the solution. And you see that in the exchange with Phoebe. He had the opportunity to take the solution. Phoebe called him out on it. The entire novel basically culminated in his exchange with Phoebe when Phoebe called him out on his problems saying, you don't like anything, and he had no legitimate response. That was a choice. If Holden Caulfield was to be redeemed, he would have taken his chance in his interaction with Phoebe. But he didn't. There is an argument that can be made. The argument being something like his interaction there that you just read with Phoebe was an encounter with the Logos. And that is a way to understand that there's something wrong with the current path. So I'll grant you that if he didn't learn anything, that the consequences are devastating. And they are in the book. And that's the ending. That's the last chapter of the book. It's the recognition of devastating consequences and mental health. So one of the characteristics of the character Holden Caulfield is that he's behaving in an unnecessary way. But there's an appeal that Holden has toward the ease of identifying problems. And he uses that ease of identifying problems as a means to abdicate responsibility. Holden Caulfield embodies a pattern of behavior where everything he encounters is insufficient. Insufficient upon what standard of metric? Who knows? He himself doesn't even identify that which is not phony. Everything is phony. Everything is insufficient. Well, it's very reactionary. He reacts to the problems at hand. He provides no alternatives. He simply observes problems and identifies problems. And even actively goes out of his way to find and justify those problems. So if he puts energy into anything, it's to find additional problems rather than additional solutions or alternatives to those problems. I Subsequently so adding on to the chaos rather than ordering it. Right. I would go so far as to say that he creates the problems. 
there are two categories of problems. There are problems that exist independently in the world, and then there are problems that exist solely as a result of Holden's perception. And in the context of Catcher in the Rye, those problems are 100% indistinguishable from each other. They are the same. Well, that's what I mean by Holden's actively going out of his way to identify problems, or as you're phrasing it, to create problems. That's also what makes it unnecessary, mm -hmm. because the creation of those problems doesn't, at least in any kind of sustainable sense, create any solutions. Any solutions that those problems generate are short-term at best and probably not even solutions at all. There has to be a reason for why he would go about saying these things. He somehow likes not liking things. That's straight out of notes from the underground. Liking well, that which causes suffering. Yeah, but it's self-referentially incoherent. You can't enjoy not enjoying things. What that translates to is to enjoy suffering. Suffering becomes the object of pursuit. Which would indicate that Holden's identification or description of all of the problems that he can possibly think of around him all the time is a means to generating an environment of suffering around him. Is that correct? Analyzed from this angle, Holden is nothing short of a villain. He is absolutely a villain. Opposed to the Logos. Even when it stands straight in front of him in the form of Phoebe. It's a scaled down version. And again, I do want to make sure that we properly address Holden mode as the identification itself of a problem which has a solution. Because the way that the term Holden mode is deployed is not a senseless identification or generation or creation of a problem, but a way to refer to an observable problem, which also allows for the generation of an alternative to Holden mode. So basically that Holden acts in a certain way, commonly, and that Holden's behavior, if we're considering the question of the Logos, that's not the best behavior that Holden can manifest, which Guess what? generates the question, well, what is the best yeah, behavior I, I, that Holden can manifest? We can rephrase this very succinctly. Holden Caulfield never once in this book asked the question, what is best? He almost does. And fails. It's not obvious that he succeeds. I'll say that. I don't think that it's his fate to oppose the Logos. And so far as what happened in this story, he spent this entire story cover to cover opposed to the Logos. He has behavior opposing the Logos, I agree. So, but there's still a kind of latent consideration for Holden that his life could be better if he only realized X. Yeah, but you can say the same thing for the underground man. Not as simply, because Holden's circumstances are scaled down. So you'd have to scale up X mm -hmm. in order to apply it to the underground man. One of the reasons why the underground man would have more of a problem, if not an impossibility, with engaging with the Logos rather than opposing it is the underground man is very entrenched in his history of opposition to the Logos. And there would have to be something deep enough and profound enough to cause a shift in his behavior entirely to the point where he never went back. And though that is a shift that's possible in people that I've witnessed, how it's many times ideal. does lightning have to strike in the same place in order for that to happen? At that point, we're just dealing with increasing layers of improbability. Well, perhaps. It depends. There are circumstances that I can describe that I've observed. But my point is more so that even if you were to grant that someone makes that kind of paradigm shift away from being a villain and starts to engage with the Logos and never turns back to opposing the Logos, that redemption can be called redemption, but it's never going to be considered entirely appropriate because there's an alternative. Just like it's possible to reverse the problem of everyone in an apartment not talking to each other, going at each other's throats because nobody's doing the dishes, it's possible to reverse that. But what ought to happen is that that problem never happens in the first place. That history is never established. And so it is with someone like the underground man. I will grant absolutely that it's unlikely that the underground man will somehow stop his evil ways and turn from his opposition to the Logos and face the Logos and never go back to his opposition. And even if he does that, it's going to be better than it was, but it's not going to be 
the situation that would have happened if he was engaging from the Logos from the beginning. Is it accurate to say that Holden Mode is a subcategory of opposing the Logos? Holden Mode is a temporary error, but if that temporary error becomes permanent and perpetual, then yes. So long as that error is not temporary, yes, it's a subcategory of an opposition to the Logos. Basically because if the objective is to find problems with all things, there's no room for the question of what's best. Because what's the problem is not the best question to ask. And by problem, we mean insufficiency. The meaning of problem in this context means to identify any given thing is somehow insufficient. And in Holden's case, it's irrationally insufficient. And the classic example, I would say, is the scene about him watching the piano player. Another way to rephrase that might be to say, it's hard to say even that it's insufficient. And that's one of the major problems with Holden Caulfield and the Holden mode problem in terms of what it's identifying. In order to say that something is insufficient, you have to establish a standard. Which he does not do. Which he does not do, because in order to say something is insufficient, there must be something that is sufficient. But there is not something that's sufficient. Sometimes, the sufficiency is purposely impossible and unachievable. Which is the idea behind his use of the adjective phony. He never once establishes that which is authentic. How do you have phoniness without authenticity? Self-referential incoherency is inherent to Holden Caulfield's character. Sure, and there's even a paradoxical way to put that, which would be that Holden is good at finding insufficiencies, that Holden is good at finding problems. The issue being that there's no way for an individual to actually be good at finding insufficiencies. It's not possible for someone to be good at finding problems. That's not actually a skill. The way that I would explain this Holden mode problem to someone historically is that it's very easy to find something wrong with another individual. It's not even individuals at that point. It can be things. Okay. I hate this school. I hate this class. Look at his I entire understand. diatribe to Phoebe. I'm looking at the term Holden mode as we would use it. Mm. And I agree. It can apply to things other than individuals. I'm emphasizing individuals and in that particularly with another individual, it's quite easy to find something wrong with them if you are looking. If your intention is to find something wrong with something the individual in front of you. Something insufficient. Something insufficient. Something to complain about. That's not impressive. Well, let's make this really tangible, particularly for those listening at home. The statement, that is unimpressive, can also be reformatted as, all human beings are flawed. All human beings are lacking in some regard. That is the reason why it is unimpressive. Partially, but there is a self-referentially coherent way to analyze the Holden mode problem, looking at Holden's identification of that which is insufficient with the person or thing or group or whatever is in front of him that he's reacting to, and that his relentless seeking of insufficiency is a process and that process is, in and of itself, an insufficient process. That's not enough. You cannot only find insufficiencies with things. Because? You must provide alternatives. Let's make sure that we're bringing the thumb way down on this. Why must the individual find alternatives? And this is the reason why I've purposefully drifted around two separate cornerstones. Cornerstone number one being the inherent inadequacy of all people. All human beings have problems. All human beings are flawed. There is no such thing as a perfect individual. Unless you want to start talking about Jesus Christ as the archetypal perfect human being, particularly as the way Dr. Peterson refers to him. Which is why to say that to find problems with an individual is unimpressive. The reason why it is unimpressive is because no human being is perfect. So you have achieved exactly nothing by identifying problems with another individual because every individual has problems. Holden takes it a step further. Holden finds potential problems. And Holden uses his resources to generate problems that are not there. The semblance of problems. 
The definition of a potential problem is a problem that has not come into existence yet, but that requires having access to a future timeline. It could be a potential problem. The problem he's identifying could be a complete fabrication. It's also not enough to point at Holden, who might create fabrications of insufficiency, and then use Holden's own intangible terminology and say that Holden is phony. That's also not enough. That doesn't go anywhere. Well, no, it does go somewhere. It goes to the hell that is outlined in Notes from the Underground. Holden goes to the hell of the Notes of Underground. And really, the extension is to say that anybody who engages in this behavior, the consequence of failing to generate alternatives is a one-way ticket to the hell of nihilism. That's what's at stake here. Instantiating a failure to generate alternatives doesn't end in neutrality. It doesn't end in simply not going anywhere. It ends in hell. It's a one-way ticket to nihilism. We're saying the same thing, so I agree. When I was saying that the logic doesn't go anywhere, I was more so commenting on the fact that calling Holden phony and using his own words is not a productive observation. It's not an alternative that leads away from the problems that Holden is already going to. Mm -hmm. Or Holden's examples of sufficiency are too absurd to be taken seriously. Such as, if I played piano, I'd play in a closet. In addition to merely identifying insufficiencies as itself being an insufficient process and therefore being unimpressive, what is impressive in the case of an individual, for example, rather than finding something wrong with an individual, what is impressive is to find things that an individual does right to find things that an individual does correctly and does well. Because it's actually quite difficult to go out of your way to find things that other people can do well. Partially because it's actually quite difficult to do something well. I have a rough draft for a potential definition for the Holden 1 problem. I've temporarily removed problem because problem goes further to explain the very terrible consequences that arise from committing to this kind of behavior. So this is a draft for Holden mode. What's your draft? So Holden mode is the process of identifying insufficiencies in people or things while failing to specify a tangible standard by which those insufficiencies can be measured. A tangible standard by which those insufficiencies and alternative sufficiencies can be measured? I suppose, because in so far as I'm seeing that, that's only to say that identifying problems can be done properly. It is possible to identify problems without falling into Holden mode. Correct. So Holden mode is definitely not a get out of jail free card for somebody who is engaging in pathology. And then the observer confronts the pathological individual and says, you are behaving pathologically. And then the pathological individual cannot just say to the person criticizing them or identifying the pathology, you're being Holden. Your criticism of my pathology is nothing but Holden mode. And therefore, I don't have to take what you say seriously. No. It's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. And the way it is not a get-out-of-jail-free card is to be able to identify your behavior is pathological by this standard that I can lay out. If you were abiding by this measuring stick, you would not be engaging pathologically. This is pathological. This standard is not. If you can answer the question of by what standard, by specifying a tangible standard, then that's not holding mode. That is not holding mode. Right. So when you say- That's Holden's way out of hell right. that so, he never takes. Exactly. I would agree. So I'm looking at your addendum of and their alternative sufficiencies. I look at those four words as merely a repeat of the term tangible standard. But the tangible standard is more than identifying insufficiencies. It's also in identifying sufficiencies. And it's actually more productive to identify sufficiencies. Any standard that is incapable of identifying sufficiencies is not tangible. There is no such thing as a tangible standard that only identifies insufficiencies. A tangible standard that only identifies insufficiencies is a contradiction in terms. 
I agree, but the way that it reads right now is that identifying insufficiencies are all that matter in terms of the tangible standard. And identifying insufficiencies, even in the face of a tangible standard, because of the tangible standard, you're going to eventually have alternative sufficiencies. But if you have alternative sufficiencies, you don't need to identify the insufficiencies anymore. That there's an alternative to identifying insufficiencies in the first place. That would be a term that would be the opposite of Holden mode. Right now, it's simply not Holden mode. But at the moment, that's just the process of generating alternatives. Because if you generate alternatives, you're also not in Holden mode. Correct. So the necessity of generating alternatives as a solution to Holden mode needs to be integral to the definition. You can't just identify the problem of Holden mode without an alternative solution built into the definition. Because otherwise, you're just identifying the insufficiency of Holden mode without actually providing the tangible standard. Do those four words solve that problem? Yes. The process of identifying insufficiencies in people or things while failing to specify a tangible standard by which those insufficiencies and their alternative sufficiencies can be measured. The attending commentary on Holden mode, as we have been saying previously, is the consequence of Holden mode is hell. Well, yeah, and that should be obvious enough that the consequence of Holden mode is hell because life has problems, a lot of them, all the time. It destroys relationships. It destroys Absolutely. the ability for people to even interact. Of course it does, because this is also a form of non-initiation. Holden mode is a subcategory of non-initiation, or non-initiation is a subcategory of Holden mode? Holden mode is a subcategory of non-initiation. Holden mode is an example of non-initiation. So non-initiation can be something other than Holden mode, but Holden mode is always non-initiation. That's important. Which goes back to the commentary about the prisoner's dilemma. Correct. Holden mode is a subcategory. Which of is how it destroys relationships. If you choose to engage in this behavior, that is. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, by the way. It's easy, but it's not binding. It's not binding. And there are things that the reader can look at in the Salinger text and say, well, there are other things that Holden could be doing. And it's actually not terribly difficult to generate them, but the thing is Holden's not generating them himself. And he needs to generate those alternatives himself. And so does the individual who initiates. They need to be generating alternatives all the time. That's a part of engaging with the Logos and asking the question of what's best. Because in order to ask the question of what's best, you have to generate the alternative. To that which is problematic. Well, you have to generate the alternative to another option that you can choose. The best option is one thing, but it's one thing over another thing. The best option cannot exist outside of a comparison. Generally speaking, yeah. And initiation is vital for mutual productivity. An individual who does nothing more than identify insufficiencies does not sufficiently contribute to resolving those problems that are getting identified, which universalizes non-initiation, where everyone's pointing at problems, but no one's ever actually doing a thing about them. Everyone's waiting for everyone else which is just a description of hell. I want to make sure that we tread carefully about this because in the same way that Holden mode is not a get out of jail free card for those engaging in pathology, as I just not. said a few moments ago, something else that self-referentially incoherent generic individuals will be familiar with is the pathological employer who says, I am only interested in solutions. I don't want to talk about the problems. I'm only interested in solutions. Your criticizing of pathological business practices is of no value because in this corporate environment, we are only interested in solutions. We're not interested in identifying problems. Well, there's actually something to that if it's true, but I'm not quite sure where you want to bring the knife down on this because I don't know if you're identifying the case where an employer is telling an employee that hold and mode isn't helpful, which it's not, or if you're identifying a situation where a pathological employer is trying to divisively manipulate their employees. The second one. The first one is not worth commentary. So then that grants that we don't have hold in the employee. So Correct. we do have an employee who is providing solutions, and those solutions are getting rejected as non-solutions. Because in that case, the employer would be the one going into hold in mode and finding all the problems with that solution. Exactly. Even though it is a viable solution, exactly they're right. trying to find problems with it, and they succeed because it's easy to find problems. In which case, their declarations of only wanting to find solutions are 
False. False. You're lying. We just need to make sure that we do due diligence pertaining to opportunities for pathological individuals to weaponize a term like hold and mode because it is a term that can be abused. It can. Particularly by those who have power and authority. There's no way for them to abuse the problem without committing the problem. So there's a self-referential coherency problem with an employer or authority figure, a malevolent authority figure using the term Holden mode to criticize someone else of only looking for problems and not finding solutions. No matter what solutions they bring, there's always a problem with them. They themselves projecting the Holden problem. They would, and that would be very confusing if you don't know what's going on as an employee. I don't know how productive that's actually going to be as an employer. It ought not be productive to manipulate your employees. Or anybody who's under you. It doesn't matter if you're talking about business or governance. Any form of leadership. Any form of leadership. Any form of hierarchical structure. Thumb up what should happen is the individual that's providing the solutions is the individual that is practicing the capacity to lead. What should happen is that the person who's providing the solutions knows that they are solutions, then the problem becomes the leader. And that has a solution too. So let's talk about a different pathological situation as well, because I just want to make sure that we can cover as much bases as we can now that we seem to have a working definition of the term. You have person A and you have person B. Person A says, there's a problem with X and here is my solution to solving X. Person B looks at person A's solution and says, that's a horrifyingly bad solution. That is such a bad solution that if you are actually going to implement that solution, you're going to make X even worse. Or you might solve X, but you're going to create another problem called Y that is going to dwarf your having solved X. You will have solved X, but you will have created Y, which is even more horrifying than X. So we should probably not use your solution. And then person A looks at person B and says, you're in holding mode. Prima facie, it seems to be that if person B only says that person A's solution to the problem of X is problematic, that he might be falling into Holden mode, but that the minute that person B says, we should actually use this solution to deal with the problem of X, that that absolves B from being able to be accused by anyone of having fallen into Holden mode. Is that accurate to say? So long as everyone's trying to figure out the question of what's best to do, then everyone's generating the best alternatives possible, which means if you generate an alternative and that alternative is worse than your current situation, then the best thing to do is to keep what you currently have, which means you need an alternative that accounts for the problems that would be created plus the ones that you currently have. That would be a tangible standard to say that that solution's not going to be a solution, it's actually going to make things worse, and this is why. It is possible for person B to say that. Well, that would be a tangible standard. And because it is a tangible standard by which you can measure X and person A's solution to X, that X is actually better than person A's solution, person B can still say that X is still better because the thing that you're comparing to is X and person A's solution to X. You should still keep X even though it is problematic. because. Right. Person A's solution to X is even worse. Just because you have a solution doesn't mean it's the best solution. It doesn't mean it's the best answer to the question. It doesn't mean it's the best circumstances. It doesn't even mean that it's better than what the circumstances default is. Correct. So that doesn't mean that providing a solution is always going to be an improvement. That should be patently obvious. An individual cannot say, for example, I am providing a solution. And because I have titled this solution a solution, it ought to replace the parameters of whatever it is I'm identifying as the parameters. No, it has to actually be better, first of all. There has to be a way to measure that. If it's not better, then it's not going to replace these parameters. If it is better, then it should. So in the situation where the proposed solution, let's just grant that the proposed solution is legitimately better than the current circumstances in every way, is legitimately better and implementable, and the best circumstances are rejected, because the authority decided that they don't like the individual's shirt that is proposing this legitimate solution, then that would be considered a holding mode at that point. But again, so long as everyone is asking the question of what's best, 
all the time for a long enough timeline, then everyone would be trying to generate the best possible alternatives, and then the best decisions can be made. A clearer way of saying that is merely to say that in a situation where all parties are connected to the logos, Holden mode cannot exist. Correct. Because someone who uses the logos and engages with the logos always does more than identify insufficiencies. Perhaps sometimes the best thing to do is to identify an insufficiency. Sometimes that's the case, but it's never the only thing that someone does when they're engaging with the logos. It's always going to be more than that. If an individual is only identifying insufficiencies, that's a telltale sign of being disconnected from the logos. Correct. There has to be more than that. Because again, that process in and of itself is insufficient. At this point, I have a question that I want to ask you. Because this is a subject that I am not 100% clear on. So now that we've established the definition of whole in mode, and we have identified the very dire consequences of engaging with Holden mode, I want to take this opportunity to see if this relates to something else that I've heard you say before. Basically, I want to be able to give you the opportunity to provide whatever explanation and commentary you wish to make in light of these other items coming into the grid. One of the things that I have heard you say in the past in the same meme-like fashion, representative of any of these other terms that we've been trying to pull into the toolkit, pull into the grid, is the phrase, you don't want Mr. Jones to come back now, do you? And that's a reference to George Orwell's Animal Farm. Mr. Jones being the farmer that the animals on the farm overthrow, and it is a phrase that the character of Squealer who is one of the pigs who's in leadership on the farm, tells the other animals to ensure that the animals stay in line and toe the line. It is a mechanism by which the pigs can maintain their authoritarian control over the farm. So the question that I want to ask you is, is Squealer's phrase, you don't want Mr. Jones to come back now, do you, at all or in any way directly tied to Holden Mode or are these two separate disconnected things? Because there seems to be some sort of connectivity with the idea of generating alternatives, with Holden Mode being an explicit failure to generate alternatives by mere virtue of the fact that there's no tangible standard. The individual engaging in Holden Mode is declaring things to be insufficient without being able to specify any sort of standard of what would or would not be sufficient. How does Squealer's line relate to Holden Mode? Where does the taxonomy connect? Is there a lateral connection? Is there a cousin connection where they both descend from a single greater idea? What exactly is the relationship between these things? I need to talk around this a little bit before I can put my finger down on exactly where it is. So, you don't want Mr. Jones to come back. That's a manipulative threat. So that's a weaponized threat. That goes into the category of manipulative statements that are deployed by a malevolent authority. It's almost a more pathetic and less creative version of Holden Mode. Because what a statement like, you don't want Mr. Jones to come back, does is it's used in the face of some kind of insufficiency or some kind of thing that is inconvenient to that authority. So the authority is identifying an insufficiency with no tangible standard by which that insufficiency is measured. It's not the same kind of insufficiency that Holden's identifying, that the authority's identifying. You don't want Mr. Jones to come back is the way that the authority is responding to a viable solution from an underling that has a chance of upsetting their authority. And it doesn't itself provide a solution. So it's a way to misdirect from the generation of alternatives because saying that you don't want Mr. Jones to come back is not engaging in the process of generating alternatives. So would it be fair to say then that the idea encapsulated in Squealer's proclamation, you don't want Mr. Jones to come back now, do you, is a subcategory of Holden Mode. It's a it's specific a, way to use Holden Mode. It's a way to use Holden Mode. I think at this point that that's correct, so we can say that for now. It seems to be a tactic for the authority to use Holden Mode 
in order to dismiss viable solutions from underlings. So going back to the earlier situation that we were discussing before about the pathological employer mm. who is saying, I'm only interested in solutions. I'm not interested in talking about problems is actually disingenuously using that statement. I am only interested in talking about solutions. I don't want to hear problems basically as a way to shirk responsibility. Again, it's really important that we assume that this leader is acting pathologically right, which because- I, Which is why I said the pathological leader. You have to be able to tell the difference because a good leader is going to be interested in generating proper alternatives. Well, what goes with that is a good leader is going to be interested in what he did wrong. Well, right. And especially that alternatives can actually fix the problems. Correct. Because there's work that needs to be done in order to actually generate those alternatives. And that's what the good leader is interested and in. And a good leader is also more fundamentally willing to take responsibility for his mistakes. Absolutely. So long as, again, there's the good not leader, only the mistake, right. but what ought to have happened. Right. The good leader says, in doing this, I messed up. I should have done this. Now that we are in this situation, this is the solution to rectify this mistake, this problem that I did, that I made. And then it goes forward from there. Sure. I mean, even if we're looking at the basic sequence for a legitimate apology, so a thumb up sequence for a legitimate apology, which is, this is what I did wrong. This is what I should have done. And it won't happen again because next time it happens, I'm going to do this instead. Mm -hmm. You don't just get to say, sorry, I did this thing wrong. It's, this is what I should have done at the time. And this is why I know it's not going to happen again, because this is what's going to be different next time. So, yeah, I agree. So in the situation where the pathological leader does not do that, the minute that anyone, particularly an underling, says to the pathological employer, you messed up this decision, this mess that we are currently in is due to this decision that you made and you should have made this decision at the time, the pathological leader exercises willful blindness about the past, hmm. saying, I don't want to talk about what the decision was. I don't want to talk about the decision that I should have made. I don't want to talk about whatever mistake I may have made because I'm only interested in the solution of how do we get ourselves out of this situation right now, mm -hmm. which is entirely pathological because like you were saying, without the post-mortem, of what happened previously, how you even got into that situation in the first place, you have no way to establish that the disaster caused by the pathological leader's previous decision won't happen again. It will happen again. Sure. That's the pathology of statements like the need to not worry about the past and to only worry about the problems as they exist now. So there's a fork that we're dealing with now. On one hand, you have the pathological leader who says, I am not interested in talking about the problems. I'm only interested in solutions. The pathological leader deploys that to shirk responsibility for a disaster that he created. The other end of that fork is, you don't want Mr. Jones to come back now, do you? That is a subcategory of Holden mode for when somebody brings up a solution to the problem and the leader or anybody at this point says, we are going to ignore your solution and we are going to commit to the status quo because you don't want Mr. Jones to come back is the tool by which I, the leader, can instantiate the status quo. So Mr. Jones coming back being the farmer of Animal Farm, Mr. Jones coming back being something that is by definition utterly horrible. We need this current we, situation in order to stave off this utterly mm -hmm. horrible situation. And that's the reason why we cannot risk having this other solution. Yeah, we because can't. if we have this other solution, then Mr. Jones is going to come back. It's not tangible how Mr. Jones is going to come back or why Mr. Jones is going to come back or why the solution is not viable. But in the face of a viable solution, the authority is saying as a pathological response, no, we can't take this viable solution because then the consequences would be intangibly absolutely horrible. So we have to do it the way that I want to do it, which is to keep me in charge. It's a complete misdirect from actually asking the question of what's better and how to generate viable solutions in order to improve a situation. The person who says you don't want Mr. Jones to come back is the person who is not engaging with the logos. Right, because the question that the authority figure at that point is refusing to confront is, how does the current situation improve 
without Mr. Jones coming back. Because if the authority figure was to actually confront that question in order to preserve his authority, the authority figure has to declare nothing. In all permutations where Mr. Jones is kept at bay is the current situation. In that subcategory of permutations, there's nothing better than the current situation. And the way that it's used in Animal Farm is that any viable solutions that are brought to the authority or any opposition or skepticism that's brought to the authority for the next round of the expansion of their centralized power is to say, well, no, we have to continue to expand or I, the pathological authority, must continue to concentrate and condense more authority into my title or else intangible horror. So it's the false dichotomy of accept my solution or expect something even worse than what you're looking at, which is also a kind of monkey character escape dance. When someone comes with a viable solution to say, well, but that's threatening to my political agenda, so we can't have that. Therefore, that viable solution is demonized as that which will intangibly bring about some utterly horrible catastrophe. I'm hoping the pathology of that strategy is clear, even though the character of the monkey is deceptive by definition. You don't want Mr. Jones to come back now. One of the main problems with that is that when a viable solution is presented, there's no reason to bring up intangible horror because it actually has nothing to do with the problem at hand so long as the Logos is concerned. The proper response to a viable solution as it's being presented to you is to consider it or to provide a viable counter solution that is reasonable. But none of these have to do with intangible abject horror. So it's always an inappropriate response. Because what the pathological leader is declaring at that point is, if this solution is implemented, then Mr. Jones will come back. Then abject horror will follow. But the problem is is that there's no way to tangibly demonstrate that that will actually happen. Well, that and by comparison, and alternatively, the proper leader would be themselves engaging in the process of generating alternatives. And if the legitimate leader is in the process of generating alternatives and engaging in the logos, then their response to someone who proposes a viable solution or a solution at all in order to evaluate its viability, if the viability of that solution is, say, ambiguous, then the response from the legitimate leader is going to be to generate additional alternatives, to accept the viable solution if it's viable, or to say that's not viable because it doesn't account for these specific problems, but if you actually come back with something that will account for all these problems, then we'll have something else to talk about. Or maybe the legitimate leader is saying, I thought about that, but we can't do that because it creates these other problems over here. So there's a way to show appreciation for the person who is not in the authority, who's trying to come to the authority with viable solutions that the authority can show. There's encouragement that can be had. So that the person leaves understanding that maybe their solution wasn't as viable as they thought. And it actually wasn't. And they can come back with something even better. That there needs to be more engagement with the generating of viable solutions. But again, that's a process of encouraging. That's a process of mentorship. Which is exactly what a legitimate leader should be doing with someone who's actually legitimately trying to help provide viable alternatives. There's no room and there's no excuse for discouraging someone who is legitimately engaging with the Logos to find viable solutions and for otherwise discouraging that person from continuing to engage in the Logos. And the way that the illegitimate leader or the pathological leader would do that is to respond to the Logos with intangible abject horror. There's a solution to this. But the problem is the solution has to deal with the question of how to respond to a pathological leader that already has authority. And if we're taking the underground man as an example, that's not something that's just probably going to completely turn itself around in terms of the orientation of that individual turning itself around from opposition to the Logos to full engagement with the Logos. That scenario is unlikely. So I suppose any individual who is engaging with the Logos and trying to find viable solutions is trying to also present those legitimate alternatives with the ability for them to be implemented. 
oftentimes there needs to be some level of authority that actually implements those viable alternatives. So in terms of initiation and the prisoner's dilemma, there's a risk that an individual engages with the Logos and has in their hand an alternative that's superior and the best option. And they bring that alternative and that work to an authority. And it's possible that that authority responds saying that we can't do that alternative because intangible abject horror. And that's information that's valuable because it means basically that you as the individual need to take that work somewhere else. Any legitimate leader is going to be able to recognize that this is valuable work, that even if that alternative is not actually viable, the process of engaging in the Logos in order to generate those alternatives is essential and needs to be cultivated. So the individual that looks to generate those proper alternatives by engaging with the Logos might be looking for a leader or might be able to themselves find it in others that they lead. And that's what's worth encouraging. And it's difficult. I've been personally disillusioned by indifferent and malevolent authorities that I've presented viable solutions to, but initiating the ability to mutually benefit is the only chance of actually finding someone else that's willing to initiate those benefits. And what's more, I know how to find it in terms of, I know how to identify the individual that's putting in the work and not putting in the work. So for the authority or the underling, person under the authority, the leaders and those who are being led. The best situation is mutual contribution, mutual engagement with the Logos. And on either side, if there's a mismatch, it's going to create an XY situation. But it doesn't mean that the best solution is to wait for someone else to initiate, even in this context, in the process of presenting viable alternatives. Again, from the perspective of the authority and from the people who are looking up to that authority. If that authority is not engaged with the Logos, that doesn't mean that there aren't people that are engaged with the Logos that are in authority at all, generally. That's not an example to take and say that there's no such thing as the Logos, encountering one person in authority that doesn't engage with it. And the same goes for the authority that has people that they're leading. In a way, both parties are benefiting massively with their engagement to the Logos, but also if there's a mismatch, there's a form of trying to encourage and mentor and instruct if possible. It's possible that someone's gone off the path slightly and that they need to be reminded of the way. But even in the case of irreversible pathology, continuing that initiation in search of another individual who is also willing to initiate is unbelievably constructive because then once that relationship is established, it's a relief for everyone. The best way to find it is to keep taking that risk of initiation. Like we were saying during the episode about initiation, you have to do it very carefully. And it's not a naive kind of courage. Another way to refer to the response of you don't want Mr. Jones to come back is to say, if the individual meets a response of abject horror and I want Mr. Jones to come back, the description of you don't want Mr. Jones to come back is essentially a dismissal and the admission of the unwillingness to generate alternatives, as well as the admission that this abject horror is not actually a threat because it's not tangible. So there's no need to be terrified of the intangible abject horror in this context if these are the parameters. That's just a method of evaluation for tangibility. You can evaluate the tangibility of the abject horror. Maybe it is tangible. If it's tangible, then you should probably take it seriously. If it's not tangible, probably not. But if it ends up being tangible and you find yourself in a situation of abject horror, you were wrong. So, worth evaluating through the lens of tangibility either way. So, by way of summary, Holden Mode is the process of identifying insufficiencies in people or things while failing to specify a tangible standard by which those insufficiencies and their alternative sufficiencies can be measured. And the reason why this is a problem is because engaging in Holden mode leads directly to the hell of nihilism. It's not something you want to do. Holden mode destroys any relationship it enters. It's self-referentially coherent because something that Holden mode does not do is Holden mode does not generate alternatives. 
So if Holden mode is all that someone does, that's going to lead to hell unless an alternative to Holden mode is generated. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Karat. So until next time, Vidorigo Esperante. Keep breathing, everyone. <laughs>